So I'll introduce myself very briefly. Um, I'm Oleg. Um, I was born in Moscow, but I actually grew up in Finland. Um, so I was there since I was 10. And uh, I studied in the UK. And um, I've also lived in Germany and Russia for a bit. And um, when I moved to Germany, I didn't know anybody. And I had just started programming JavaScript. This was about like four years ago, five years ago. And when I say programming JavaScript, I mean everybody's done JavaScript, but I would argue that only 1% of people that pro uh, program JavaScript actually know, know the language. And around the same time, I, so when I was in, in Germany, I didn't know anybody. And around the same time, the first uh, JavaScript meetup in Cologne got started. And uh, that's how I got involved with the JavaScript community. And the JavaScript community is a great thing because it's not a kind of a formal structure. Um, there's just lots of meetups, lots of events, lots of people putting conferences together like this one. And uh, if you want to find out what's going on around the world, all you need to do is go to communityjs.org. So I've contributed to the worldwide JavaScript community because when I was in Moscow, there wasn't a meetup there. So me and Anton from Axshell, we started the Moscow meetup. And that's still going quite strong, although it would be nice if there were uh, the meetups were a bit more frequent. Anybody from Moscow here? OK. Come talk to me afterwards um, so we can like reboot the Moscow JS effort a little bit. Um, I was only in Moscow for about a year, though. And then I moved to Helsinki. And in Helsinki, it was kind of the same thing. It wasn't really a regular meetup for JavaScript developers. It was like a front-end meetup, but there wasn't um, uh, one for developers as such. So I started Helsinki JS uh, a little bit over a year ago, and now Helsinki JS is the biggest um, developer meetup in the country. That's regular. Uh, it takes place every month. Okay, um, I do other things as well, though. Um, I work a lot with startups, and I work with investors. And uh, actually, the last time I was in Minsk was about a month ago with this program called Startup Sauna. If you haven't heard of that and you're doing a startup, you should definitely check it out. And in fact, I know there are some people that I've met through Startup Sauna here in the audience today. Having worked with startups a lot, I'm now running my own startup. And uh, that's called Start HQ. And uh, this presentation is going to be um, essentially about my experiences of using AngularJS while building uh, the initial version of StartHQ. StartHQ is a new tab replacement. So when you go to Chrome, for example, you open a new tab, you see Google's kind of new tab replacement. I wanted to build something better uh, and something that was more useful to businesses and business users. But before we uh, start talking about Angular, I wanted to just kind of um, say a little bit about the philosophy of JavaScript and something that I kind of discovered as I've been uh, interacting with a lot of JavaScript developers. JavaScript is mostly about uh, toolkits, right? It's about micro libraries. It's about uh, essentially building your own set of tools every time you start a project. And I don't know why that is, um, but it probably has something to do with the fact that when you uh, build a web app, you want to make it as small as possible. So there's this tendency to avoid um, kind of big monolithic frameworks. So there's no like Java equivalent, or at least there hasn't been until recently um, for building web apps. All right, so you have these building blocks, and uh, you assemble your, your uh, own framework, and sometimes you get it wrong. Right? So what's the difference between a framework um, and a toolkit? Well, um, a framework, on the other hand, already has something ready-made for you. So it's a ready-made house, and you have to play by its rules. You can just put your dolls in there, and uh, but everything is kind of decided for you, and you can't really change it all that much. And I'm not saying one is better or the other, but I think it's important to make that distinction um, and realize which, which path you're going down. Um, so just to kind of summarize that, um, whereas uh, with a library you call it, with a framework, the framework calls you. And typically with applications built using frameworks, there isn't really a clear 
main method or like an entry point. It's up to the framework to decide, to decide how, how it calls you and how it starts up your application. So let's um, kind of take a bit of a step back and uh, look at how, how we've evolved to be where we are. Okay, sorry. Um, so we had the DOM API, and I, I believe the first talk was a little bit about the history of JavaScript and its relationship to the DOM API. And those were the dark ages. And then jQuery came on the scene. And jQuery made it possible for us to manipulate the DOM across browsers without having to, um, you know, spend too much effort dealing with the browser differences. And jQuery is still a great tool for building, um, extending uh, and adding a little bit of uh, dynamic functionality to individual pages. But I don't know if anybody has had to deal with a large jQuery application. It gets very messy very quickly. In fact, uh, in my experience, the only pe people that can maintain it are the ones that wrote it in the first place, and even they struggle sometimes. And that's largely because um, the separation between the model and the view isn't that clear. The functionality kind of jumps over the place and so on. So Backbone, Backbone came on the scene to address some of those concerns, but Backbone is very much in the toolkit realm in that Backbone doesn't even give you all the utility methods and the functionality you need to build your own application. Um, if you look at anybody who's built a serious Backbone application, they've always had to build their own little helper methods and utility classes on top of it. Now, admittedly, other libraries like Marinette have emerged, which fill some of those gaps, but it's still very much of a case of um, you dealing with the DOM and Backbone just providing you a little bit of structure. Um, okay, so I think now we're entering the new age where we have much more mature frameworks um, because people have realized that front-end code is actual computer code and you need to apply some um, software engineering practices to it. And uh, there's, I would argue, three main contenders. One is Angular, there's Knockout, and there's Ember.js. And I think there'll be a talk on Ember um, in another track later today, so you should, you should check that out as well. But this will talk, will, will be about Angular. And I'm not gonna go into why I picked Angular, but I'll just show this slide, which is Google Trends for searches for the different frameworks. And um, this was in January. If you look at it now, the difference is even more clear. But I wouldn't say that this means that Angular is the more popular framework, uh, necessarily. I mean, you need to take these things with a grain of salt. Um, it could just mean that Angular has terrible documentation. Which, which it does, actually, so that's probably all that that shows. Okay, Angular. <coughs> So most people think that um, Angular is a Google project and it started out as a Google project. That's actually not true. From what I understand, um, there's, there's, there was a startup which um, built something or other and um, it was acquired by Google. And um, one of the engineers, and, and they had a framework that made it easier for them to build whatever it was that they were building. And at Google, there was a project uh, where some of the team members from that startup were involved and they needed to implement a feature and it was going to take them like three months or something. Um, and then Misko, who was the guy who had, like the initial creator of Angular, said, if this was written in Angular, I could uh, rewrite this whole app as it currently stands and add this new feature and uh, do it in a week. And um, he clearly had a very wise manager because the manager said, I dare you to do it. I don't think you can do it. If any of your managers here, it's a great way to get uh, good results from developers. You should uh, challenge them. And um, Misko went away, uh, and he worked like for 14 hours for seven days straight. Um, but he did pull it off. So Google started ag using Angular a lot more internally and gradually built up a team around the project. And uh, they've kind of been under the radar for a couple of years working on this, and they've only really started marketing it in the last uh, six months or so. But most of the marketing is taking place in the US. They were in Europe briefly, but I think uh, Angular is relatively unknown um, you know, in, in the Russian-speaking world. Maybe I'm wrong. How many of you here have used Angular? 
All right, things are getting a lot better. There's a funny thing about um, kind of the Russian-speaking developer community and the English-speaking one is that I think sometimes things get lost in translation. Um, I, I contribute to this blog called Daily JS, and uh, if any of you have any open source libraries and you want them covered there, just uh, drop me a line and I'll get Alex to do it. But um, I interviewed Ryan, the creator of Node, um, and that, that was like made up into a blog post on Daily JS, and then. Um, Essentially, somebody translated this uh, into Russian, and, and, and it got posted on Haber, and everybody was commenting about what an idiot the guy doing the interview is. He knows that this stuff already exists in Node. But the problem was that the interview was done like a year and a half before it was translated. So I strongly encourage you to kind of re go to the original source and read the English blogs and the English language documentation, English language examples, and watch the English language videos. Um, so you can actually hear about the, these technologies from the horse's mouth. Um, for example, Misko, the creator of Angular, has given a number of great talks, and his English is quite easy to follow. You should watch those videos. But um, back to Angular, I mean, kind of the one-liner, which I think is quite good, is that Angular is what HTML would have been had it been built for uh, making web apps. And as we know, HTML was originally meant for uh, uh, presenting documents. The fact that we happen to be all here working on using HTML for building web apps is almost like a historical um, kind of mistake. We're, we're just like JavaScript, right? JavaScript isn't the best language out there, but we're all kind of stuck with it. So we have to do uh, the most that we can. There have been attempts at, to abstract away HTML, things like GWT, Cappuccino, and others come to mind. Um, but um, that extra abstraction means that doing the first um, half of the project is very easy, but then the moment you need to implement something custom, like a custom component, all of a sudden it becomes very hard. Um, this, and this is where Angular is different. But um, another, another, there's another trend, which is, um, and this is kind of anecdotal evidence, but People say that in most applicate front-end apps, client-side applications, you tend to spend about 80% of the time dealing with manipulating the, the DOM. And that's a little bit silly because uh, you know, it should be easier than that. Um, and, and Angular um, really helps with that by making most of those 80% go away. And um, another, th another thing worth noting is that if you look at the code on the server and the code on the client, another trend has been that um, more and more of the code and the business logic ends up actually taking place on the client, and that's a trend as well. So we're going to have our work cut out for us. Um, but some things about Angular aren't quite in line with the JavaScript way. Um, one of those, for example, is that it is most definitely not a toolkit. Um, it is very much a framework. And I think that puts a lot of people off, because it sort of seems like there's a super steep learning curve, and you, you know, you're not going to... Um, be able to uh, learn all of it, and you're not going to probably use all of the functionality that it, that it offers. Um, so a lot of people kind of discard it when they first look at it. And I have to admit, I was kind of um, cynical when I first saw it as well. Skeptical, rather. Um, some of the features it offers are listed here, but actually um, I'm going to quickly run through those features and explain how they work. So there's no need to read them out loud here. So that's kind of what Angular looks like, and that's pretty much what it is. Um, but there's a reason for it. So if you look at backbone apps and jQuery apps, um, most of them are imperative. In other words, even if you use templating or whatever else, um, there's a lot of code that um, deals with um, sort of explaining how things should look, right? So um, there's code that actually manipulates the DOM. Um, uh, Angular, on the other hand, is declarative. So what you have is your view and the data, and uh, you actually show how the end results should be straight from the view. You're not assembling DOM on the fly. It should be actually possible to tell what an application does 
just by looking at the template, Angular template. Whereas if you look at most uh, templates and other JavaScript frameworks, I would argue that it's very hard to tell what the app as a whole does. Uh, as I also mentioned, Angular doesn't abstract away the DOM. Uh, it rather augments it with something called directives. So these can be either tags or attributes on existing tags that add um, extra functionality. But because Angular is a framework, um, one of the things that I personally don't like all that much is that Angular has many ways of doing the same thing. And I'll show some of them later, but that means that learning it is actually quite tricky because you sort of look at examples and they show things one way, and then you look at some other code elsewhere and it's actually something else and it's hard to tell whether those are the same thing under the hood, whether they're actually different and it's a new feature that you, you missed. So one of the key things, um, actually before we do that, let me uh, just show you a quick example. I'm not uh, courageous enough to do like a full blown live coding demo, but um, okay, I've managed to completely break this. Mm. I thought I would, uh, can you see that code okay? Okay, so this is like the Hello World Angular app. I've tried to make the font as big as possible so everyone at the back would see. Um, so here we include Angular, uh, we have the body. Um, the key thing to note here is that we have this ng app attribute or directive which tells Angular where to actually um, where it's allowed to modify the DOM. The nice thing about Angular is that you don't have to um, replace the whole DOM. You could, for example, have some other frameworks in use or it can be mostly server-side generated HTML and you can sort of confine Angular to only be a part um, of, of the HTML page. But in this case, you know, the whole example is an Angular app, so it's, it's right at the top. And um, here we've literally got um, two Angular features. So the first one is this ng model directive, which um, essentially defines an attribute that's attached to a scope, which we don't see yet. Um, and then um, we we have interpolation in, in place. So this whole thing is an Angular template. And what this does is it uses two-way data binding to actually link up this name, that's a piece of data attached to the scope, um, with this name here, which is part of the um, the view. And this is kind of the canonical Angular example, but if you type Minsk, you can see the data updating in real time. And if you look at these kind of examples, and there's plenty of them, you get the impression that um, Angular is great for like having your entire page update as you uh, type stuff into input boxes. But that's actually just a kind of a neat example. Um, the, this two-way data binding is actually a much more powerful feature that lets you do a whole bunch of other things that I'll show later. So what's happening under the hood? If you look at other frameworks like Ember and Knockout, I mean, this start, or even jQuery, this, this starts looking like uh, black magic. Like, how is it possible that you type something in here and it appears there? And yeah, it pretty much is black magic. There's a lot of very complex stuff happening under the hood. And if you ever have to debug it, I feel very sorry for you. Um, but if I'm mean, kind of to try and oversimplify it, then what actually happens is Angular has a reference of the data. Whenever the input values change, um, then a, a copy of that data is created. And any um, of the changes coming in either from the inputs or um, methods attached to the scope, so you can have also code that somehow modifies the data, is run. And then the two data structures are compared one against another, and the differences are kind of plucked out, and then they're translated into changes to the DOM. So Angular takes care of all of that for you, and you don't have to worry about adding or removing DOM elements or um, keeping track um, of what the values are and so on. And if you have to do that yourself, it can be, I mean, it's a huge amount of work. Anyway, that's kind of a trivial example, um, but I'll just kind of show you. 
there. Wonderful. This is me fighting with the open office for 10 minutes here. Okay. You know what? I think I'm just going to do that and I'm going to open it again. Oh no. This is like terrible. All right, so we kind of saw the whole thing with um, uh, like the basic example, but the, the key is actually scopes. So the way in which the DOM um, and, and the data are linked up together is through scopes. Not telescopes, but angular scopes. Um, and I'll show a quick example of um, how you create a scope um, and the controller that's associated with that scope. Um, just in a moment, a little bit afraid of doing this because I know that I'm going to have to restart open office again. But, uh, all right. So. Okay, so this is our previous example extend extended a little bit. So the key thing to note here is um, on our body we specified what controller we use, and then inside it, when we reference the name, and, and, and this controller is defined in code up here, and uh, in the code when we reference the name, this time we're actually uh, referencing um, this uh, variable attached to the scope here, which is why it's uh, pre-populated now. Okay, but I mean, from this point on, it works just as before. Right. Um, in addition, being, being able to attach uh, like data to scopes, you can also attach functions, like, just like that. And you can trigger those functions through directives, such as ng-click. These functions can also return data, so for example, um, if I had like a span with an ng-model uh, value here, I could actually return that result of a function. Um, and um, here when I click, this hello thing will run and it'll just uh, pluck out the name from the scope. Uh, show in an or box like this. Okay. Sometimes I really wish I knew how to. Uh, oh, there we go. That looks fine. Okay. Uh, I think I know what's going on actually. There we go. Creates another window. Um, anyway, scopes um, can actually uh, be inside other scopes, and um, scopes inherit from each other uh, using JavaScript's prototypal inheritance. And at the very root of the document, even though you don't see it, there's a root scope, which means that if you um, like globals, Angular discourages you from using globals, but if you really like them, you can just attach a whole bunch of stuff to the root scope and kind of recreate globals in Angular is not something you should do, but you can do. And sometimes it's a useful hack. Also, just like for the prototypal inheritance, if you set something on the root scope, you can read from it just fine within any scope. But if you have a scope further down the chain and you set something on that with the same name, then that obscures the value in the root scope from that child scope, uh, which is um, a potential cause of bugs if you don't expect that to happen. So something to be aware of. And um, something that's recommended is that the scope should really just be kind of a, a connector to your data, and you shouldn't have the data attached to the scope itself. So, for example, in my case, I have you know, the, the name array. If I wanted the name array to be a piece of data that's used across the applications and accessed for multiple scopes, I should actually be referencing it indirectly uh, rather than directly. So I should have something like scope.data.name, right? And I should reference that data object from the scope. That way, if I modify that reference, then the original data isn't uh, kind of gone and lost to me. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay. So you saw what templates look like, um, but um, there's um, 
a bit more to them, but not a whole lot more. It took me like 30 minutes to find a, a picture that was remotely related to templates. If anybody has any good template photographs, let me know. Um, <clears throat> so we saw interpolation, and that, that works uh, just by using the double curlies. But um, sometimes you don't want to do that. Um, there's two reasons why you don't want to do it. The first reason is that Angular doesn't run until a little bit later. So you actually can, um, like, if you if you have a big application, you can actually see a bit of a flicker as your um, DOM with the template is shown first, and then Angular runs, and and then those curly brackets are actually replaced with the real values. Um, so that's not so good. So um, another reason why double curlies aren't that great is if uh, you're generating some uh, HTML on the server and using things like mustache or anything that's compatible with mustache, by using double curlies on the server, you essentially apply the templating logic on the server, and then by the time it gets to the client, you no longer um, have the double curlies because they've been filled in by mustache. So there's another way to do the same thing, which is to use the ng dash something or other, like ng uh, model, um, for example, or ng source if you're uh, uh, modifying like the anchor tag source attribute. And uh, that, that's handy, um, but th that's an example of how it's kind of the same thing, more or less, um, but there's two different ways of doing it. Um, there's, all, there's a directive or a set of directives called ng show and ng hide, which let you show or hide um, parts of the DOM depending on um, the data. And there's also um, more of a CSS rule rather than a pure directive, but something called ng cloak that lets you cloak stuff before, DOM, before Angular has had time to load so that you don't see that flicker effect. And then when it has loaded, then um, Angular changes, removes ng cloak, which is just essentially a CSS rule that says display none on that element. Um, you can cycle through elements with ng repeat, and that's what the logic looks like. And um, it's also worth noting that you can shove logic into templates, which is like totally against uh, all rules and everything we've learned to date but it can be quite handy and powerful at times. When you're prototyping, uh, you don't want to uh, put everything in the controller, um, so you just um, write, write something within your, uh, your actual template, your view, and once you get it working, you can refactor that out of the template into methods on the controller. So I'll show the third and last example. Um, I think it's last anyway. Um, just to show you what that looks like. Okay, so so here's our controller, and uh, now we've removed name as initial scope attribute, and we've added one called names, which is just an array of different cities. And um, here we have um, the list, and we cycle through them, just like I, I showed before. And this name is that name. And obviously, this can be a more complex object. So fairly straightforward stuff. I guess if you're coming at this from like a mustache or handlebars background, then it's worth noting that it's the entire element that's repeated multiple times. It's not just a single li with a bunch of names in it. And, um, and then, uh, because the two-way data binding, we can just have this add thing here, which is this method on the scope. So when we, uh, when that gets called, we can just push the current name, which is the name in the input box, to that array, and we can set the name to an empty string to clear the input box, and uh, we'll uh, have like a simple um, kind of a form that does this. Uh, let's say London. Right. 
So let's talk about modules. You've probably uh, seen Node.js modules, and you may have seen Require.js asynchronous modules. Angular modules are kind of orthogonal to those modules, in that on the surface they look the same, but actually they do a lot more. And you can kind of actually combine them with common JS and require modules, but in practice there's no, no need to do so. Get my module picture right there. Again, the best I could come up with. So, in our previous example, we just kind of defined the controller straight in the global scope, um, and all was good until somebody else that decides to define another variable in the global scope with that name, and you don't want to be polluting the global scope. So really in Angular, all of your code should be inside a module. And the way you define modules is through this Angular, so Angular just exposes one global called Angular, and um, your entire app kind of sits inside that. And the way you define modules is through this module function. So to define a module called app, um, you pass app as a string as the first parameter. And then after that, you pass an array, which includes the names of the dependencies. And that's your module definition right there. What's, what's interesting is that, un unlike require or node, there isn't a one-to-one -one mapping between file names and modules. So you can have multiple modules in the same file if you like that. You can have the same module spread across multiple files for that. And that can get a little bit confusing. If you look at a lot of examples, they go a little bit crazy with the modules. They define a bunch of modules, like they put all the directives into modules. Some people even put each directive or each controller into a separate module, and that's completely unnecessary. It's all really just boilerplate. Um, until the application gets really big, you're better off just using one module. And that module can just be named app, for example, although there isn't a convention. Um, it's worth noting that um, Looking at this previous example that we saw, saw the source code. Um, if your main module is called app, then you should put ng app equals quote unquote app. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Um, right. Um, once you actually have the module object, uh, there's really two things that you can do to it. Um, there's like a configuration phase, and there's the run phase. And Strangely enough, you rarely use the run phase. You mostly just configure stuff. And this is kind of an example of how Angular is a framework. So you configure stuff, and you kind of tell Angular, this is what I've configured. And then Angular goes off and picks the bits you've configured for it and builds up your application from those bits. So it's kind of an inverse of, of the way in which we're mostly used to writing applications. And uh, there's a number of convenience methods, but really those are just wrappers for config. And they are uh, called controller, which lets you directly define a controller inside a module directive. Same thing for directive, filter, value, factory, and provider. I'm not going to go into too much detail on those, but you should just know that under the hood, those are just calling .config. Um, also, in a way similar to Node, um, there is like a, a directory of modules. You can find it at ngmodules.org. But unlike Node, which uh, has a very kind of a good structure and tools for installing those modules, with Angular, it's all a bit of a mess. And different people's ideas about what constitutes a module, which go into a module, are very different. Some are like a collection of 50 directives. Others might be a single directive, for example. Uh, so I think it's still pretty early days when it comes to an ecosystem of reusable um, no, uh, Angular modules. But um, hopefully one day we will have reusable components. Uh, at the moment, you have to kind of um, write them yourself. But fortunately, it's quite easy, as we'll see in a moment. Another thing worth um, talking about is uh, injection. And not the kind of vaccination type of injection, but dependency injections. Um, so in our example, we saw this magical scope variable uh, passed the first argument to our controller. And that's just an example. Um, because if you write code that looks like that, what will happen is that it'll work just fine until you need to minify it, and then it'll break. And this is an example of Angular's black magic uh, at work, because 
If you don't minify the code, what actually happens is under the hood, Angular does two string on the controller function. It actually parses out the names and it figures out the order in which the arguments should be passed in. So if I had something else I wanted to inject into the to-do controller, I could put it there as well and I could change the order at will and it would all work. It's great for examples and showing how powerful it is. It's terrible when you actually have production code because that code can't be minified. And in true Angular fashion, there's more than one way to do it. So you can actually define your controller, return it, and on it have an inject attribute that tells the controller what should be injected into it. But then you have this issue that you kind of use things in one place and you define them somewhere else completely. So that's very confusing. So I've kind of settled on this pattern, um, which is not pretty, um, but it works. So the pattern is you give the controller a name, like so, an app is just the module that we defined earlier. And then into it, uh, you pass like the name, and then the second argument is an array. And that array has um, the things you want to inject, their names, and uh, the last argument is the actual function, the controller function in our case. And uh, over here, you, like as the first argument, you would have scope, and so on and so forth. And the order is the same as what you defined here. And, and that, that works pretty well. There's kind of a little bit of boilerplate, but it's very readable and it's easy to see what's going on. Yeah, so um, one thing about injection and why it's super useful, um, and that's because essentially under the hood, the Angular injector takes care of instantiating stuff for you. Um, and sometimes like you provide the thing that's instantiated, but other times Angular provides the thing that's instantiated. So in this particular case, the scope is created automatically by Angular. Um, if you define uh, a service, for example, something like an HTTP service, which is a wrapper for making XHR requests, then that thing is, is, is instantiated only once across the entire application. And every time you inject it, it's exactly the same object that's injected into your controller. But um, because the relationship is flipped, so it's not you saying what you want to pull in, it's the framework telling your control controller what it can get, what, what it can have. It means that unit testing uh, becomes a lot easier because you no longer need to have like go through it, a complicated dance um, to provide mocks to your functions that you want to test, but rather you can have multiple injectors injecting multiple different HTTP services that are actually mocks that provide stubs that don't actually talk to a server but always respond with the same thing. That's powerful stuff. So. Angular has kind of testing baked in at its core. All right, views. Here's a nice view. Um, yeah, so your application tends to have, um, how are we doing for time? Uh, six minutes. I'll have to rush through the rest of this. Uh, but fortunately, there isn't much left. So um, your application, uh, like a single page app, tends to have. Um, like a URL, and then there's a part of your application that's Chrome, that's like the menu, the footer, or whatever, and then there's the main part of the application, which is your view, and the contents of your view depend on whatever URL you currently have. Right? So as a result, in an Angular app, you can only have one view, and the way in which you say where that view is is you just put ng-view attribute on the element where you want the main view to be. Uh, but if you need to include things like nav bars and you want to put them in a separate file, you also have this uh, um, ability to go to use ng include. And internally, views and includes are kind of the same, except that you only have one view. And uh, views are closely linked to routing. Another cool picture there. Um, and, and the way you set up routes is like this. So if you want to use HTML5 push state, which you should by default, because if you add it, or enable that as an afterthought, um, a lot of things will break and you'll have to fix them. Whereas if you enable it from the beginning, things will be broken from the beginning and you will fix them as you work on them. Um, and you essentially um, then say, I'm going to skip kind of the boilerplate of how you inject the route provider and so on. Um, this is just the main code that you can shove into the run method of your um, app module, um, where you say, when the URL looks like this, and you can have patterns, you know, you can have parameters in the URL. Um, then that's the, the template um, or the view that I should load. And that's the controller I should use. Although you can also um, define the controller inside the 
that, that you should use inside the view itself. And then finally, you know, when you run out of options, you know, a kind of a 404 equivalent is this otherwise statement. Directives. So, I mean, this is a huge topic, and there isn't enough um, time to cover it, so I'll be brief. Um, you essentially um, have um, this ability to define directives that are, can be attributes or, or whole elements, and um, this is how you define them. It's uh, tempting to wrap jQuery plugins as directives, but as we found out, um, you're better off just scrapping the plugins and writing your own stuff in Angular yourself. For example, we did something that um, implemented the um, placeholder attribute in HTML5 um, as a shim for older browsers that don't have it built in. We had a look at the jQuery, most popular jQuery plugin to do it, and it was this terrible thing, like 300 lines of code, adding data to the DOM and so on, and that's what everybody uses apparently. We rewrote that in Angular, and it was like 10 lines less. Um, very tight and works exactly the same way. Um, something you can Google is also W3C components because um, directives in Angular um, may lead to you being able to actually define components and have like a calendar component that's reusable across applications. And, and I've seen people do that already. But um, there's more standardization taking place. And there's other things in Angular which unfortunately we don't have time to cover, but you should definitely check out yourself. So you can have filters. So your data is always a date, for example, but you can display it in different ways using different filters. There's promises, which we've covered. Um, there's also events, so that um, you can pass data back and forth between the different um, controllers without the controller having to know anything about the source that emits those events. And um, then we've got the testing story, um, which, uh, again, is baked into Angular, and it, you can, all, you can do both unit tests and end-to-end -end tests. Um, for an example of what a testing setup in Angular looks like, you should check out the Angular Seed project and take a look at the Karma test runner. The cool thing is you can actually write code saying, like, click this, click that, and then expect this div to contain that text. And you can run those across the different browsers using Karma. So uh, there's a few links I've included here, and these slides will be shared. I've actually got a little project that more or less follows this presentation that you can just check out on GitHub. Uh, I also highly recommend the Egghead.io videos. These are like short three-minute tutorials that introduce you to the basics of Angular. And um, when you use Angular, you sort of tend to go through this sort of process that you're, uh, you, you're like, it's really cool at first, and then, oh, this sucks. And then you start liking it again and so on. And I think it's a lot easier if you um, know this as you go into it that... Um, you know, this is going to be a bit of a roller coaster, um, but you'll be better off for it in the end. So to summarize, Angular is complex, um, but um, it's, it's like that for a reason. And once you start using it, you do end up being more productive. At least that's been the experience with me. Um, you shouldn't be afraid to forget everything you know and throw it out the window. So if you've used jQuery before, for example, I strongly recommend you not to include jQuery in your project and try and keep it out for as long as you possibly can because jQuery actually has its own implementation of like the, uh, or Angular has its own implementation of the jQuery selector engine and it just uses that if jQuery isn't available. And also, um, rather than using jQuery plugins, try and implement the same thing as an Angular directive. Your code will probably be much more maintainable as a result. But um, I guess if I'm to get all philosophical here, then just make sure that Angular and a single page app is really what you need. Because with StartHQ, we kind of built this thing using Angular, and nobody used our application, which was, it was like a city with lights turned off. People would just hit the site, read the text, bounce, and never even log into the app. So we released um, kind of an extra element to the application, which was um, a um, kind of web application directory where you can find the web apps that you need for work, like different SaaS solutions, like a CRM solution or a development project management tool or whatever. And that's become really popular. But the ironic thing about it is that that's just a typical CRUD app. When we first released it, it, it was all HTML generated server side and there was no Angular there at all. Now we've gradually been adding more and more Angular code to that app, but um, really Angular is just a nice to have for the directory. It's not a must have. Thank you very much.
And you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, and you can check out StartHQ at StartHQ.com. Будут ли какие-то вопросы? Да, можно по-русски, в общем. Я просто позвольте несколько вопросов сразу. Да. А сегодня у нас необычайно большое количество MVC-подобных фреймворков, uh -huh. и, наверное, каждый разработчик сталкивается с проблемой выбора того или иного фреймворка. Вот интересно было бы вкратце, может быть, несколько пунктов услышать от вас, почему все-таки Angular, да, а почему, чем он лучше, там, каких-то аспектов тех же Recon, Knockout и прочее. А еще один вопрос, скажем так, еще полгода назад, когда я знакомился с Angular, uh -huh. а мне показалось, что там довольно высокий уровень вхождения. Да. То есть, ну, своя специфика плюс не очень, а, ну, мне так показалось, хорошая документация, которая а, там, много каких-то специфических терминов. А как сейчас дела с этим обстоят? То есть, хотелось uh -huh. бы тоже услышать, если вы в курсе. А, такая немножко холиварная еще тема. Как вы относитесь к дата биндингу, вот к декларативному стилю? В принципе, то есть просто какое-то время назад, еще в 2000-х, мы боролись с этим. У нас даже такой термин был, ненавязчивый JavaScript. Теперь мы как-то похожи на то, что все-таки что-то возвращается. И последний вопрос. Да, совсем так, последний. я уже первый давно забыл. Ну, хорошо. Фреймворк от Google — это, конечно, большой плюс этому фреймворку. Но, может быть, вы в курсе, в каких проектах реально Google используется этот фреймворк. Угу. Спасибо. Хорошо. Начну с конца. Вот. И, может быть, я дойду до первого вопроса, если я его еще буду помнить. Насчет проектов есть сайт showcase.angular.js.org, да, и там как бы список разных приложений. Старточки используют AngularJS. В Google большой проект, они приписали весь Overture, то есть это как бы сервис для рекламодателей, как я понимаю. Um, у них огромная куча пользователей, и все они используют. То есть весь этот сервис использует написанный Angular, они его полностью с нуля переписали. Um, по поводу дата биндинга, я согласен, что логику... Um, как бы темплей писать неразумно. Um, вот, поэтому как бы для, на, на стадии прототипирования это может быть удобно, но логику нужно как можно быстрее запихивать в контроллеры. Um, почему я выбрал Angular? Вот, просто потому что я думаю, что так же как с Backbone uh, из jQuery, на какой-то стадии как бы, было много разных вариантов. Да? А сейчас все используют jQuery. Мало кто помнит Mutu, Dojo и так далее. То же самое с Backbone, были всякие Spine там и прочее. Вот. Angular это как бы следующее поколение фреймворков, хотя многие сравнивают его с Backbone. Я, мне кажется, что это как бы эволюция а, библиотек. И а, как бы посмотрев на Google тренды, посмотрев на а, комьюнити, посмотрев на пообщавшись с создателями и спикерами, я просто думаю, что люди, которые стоят и работают на Angular, они более профессиональны, вот, и у них наилучшие шансы так сказать, создать фреймворк, uh, который мы будем использовать через несколько лет. Um, скажем, Ember, к примеру, очень тесно на данной стадии к рельсам привязан. Knockout, синтаксис не очень понятный, то есть там нужно вручную этот биндинг делать и так далее. Вот. Но как бы, если внутри команды вашей вы используете рельсы, то, может быть, стоило бы использовать Ember. Вот. Но если бы я начинал с нуля, я бы, я бы выбрал Ember. По поводу чего? А, с документацией жутко, в общем, на самом деле. А, вот. но, но я надеюсь, что как бы вот презентации такого рода и другие, вот, и если вы будете использовать Angular, вы будете общаться с другими разработчиками, которые используют Angular, то станет понятно, как бы, что нужно делать, а что, а что не стоит. Вот. И как бы, все-таки комьюнити настолько большой, что создаются всякие примеры, приложения, те же видео, Egghead.io, которые очень четко и ясно объясняют, да, как положено вещи делать. Вот. И на самом деле с документацией все-таки в Angular сталкиваешься довольно-таки редко. То есть, когда нужно что-то посмотреть, да, нужно загуглить, на это уходит там, минут 15. Но после этого, написав это, как бы прелесть Angular в том, что ты большинство своего времени не тратишь на то, что ты сморочишься с, с библиотекой, с фреймворком, а ты пишешь свое приложение. То есть, на самом деле, это продуктивно. Да. Спасибо за доклад. А, два вопроса. Первый uh, это перформанс, который немного беспокоит. Mm -hmm. да? Просто не, не есть немного шума такого, что через некоторое количество ивентов в системе сколько накапливается и так далее и тому подобное, появляются какие-то 
Амазон. Да? А это провокация или нет? И второй вопрос – это кастом теги, директивы, кастом атрибуты и так далее и тому подобное. Был ли опыт каких-то проблем? Да. Нет, в реальном, в реальном да, месте. хорошо. А, вот. В общем, по поводу первого вопроса, да, многие спрашивают, вот если у меня, скажем, страница, да, я хочу отобразить таблицу, в которой 10 тысяч рядов, да, я уверен, что Backbone или там чистый jQuery будет намного быстрее реагировать. Да, конечно, но что за это за user experience, если у вас таблица 10 тысяч рядов? А, то есть обычно как бы на экране отображается там максимум, может быть, 100 дом элементов, не больше. Вот. Если на самом деле хотите показать тысячу рядов, то это нужно делать так, что у вас может быть есть массив, в котором тысяча рядов, да? но вы свой view делаете так, что эм, как бы Angular или там Backbone работает только с сотней. Вот. И как бы, у вас окно на, это, на, на эту сотню из там, десятки тысяч. Это первое. Вот. Эм, еще в Хельсинке есть один товарищ, он вообще-то диссертацию пишет на тему, э, он сравнивает скорость Angular и Backbone. И мы с ним общались в последнее время, он говорит, что в простых э, примерах, там, типа to do MVC, MVC, да, то Angular где-то раз в пять медленнее Backbone. Ну хорошо, но это какой-то мало, э, как бы, сказать, синтетический пример, да, который как бы не основан на реальном положении. Потому что в Backbone нужно вручную добавлять, убирать все event handler и так далее. То есть э, там очень просто сделать так, что просто забудешь убрать что-то и будут сплошные memory leaky повсюду. А с Angular же этого нет, потому что Angular делает все за тебя. То есть если это есть, то это баг Angular, который, скорее всего, починит. Но ты, как разработчик, никогда вручную э, с этими хендлерами э, не паришься и их не трогаешь. Вот. То есть, на самом деле, я думаю, приложение, э, написанное Angular, просто намного более стабильные будут, их намного будет легче поддерживать э, и дебажить меньше. А, да, по поводу кастом тегов. Э, не знаю, как бы это связано с этими web components. И если честно, я не знаю, некоторые люди, как бы, э, я общался вот с одним товарищем, который как бы главный архитектор FCQ, очень большая компания в э, Финляндии. Вот. Он ненавидел кастом таги, он говорит, поработал пару недель с ними и начал ну, писать вообще кастом таги для всего. Вот. То есть у них там куча библиотеков разных виджетов, кастом таги для date picker и так далее. И ему это жутко нравится. Вот. Если честно, я думаю, эта малость как-то, ну, это какой-то экстрим. Эм, то есть, если на самом деле есть несколько проектов, на самом деле нужны разные виджеты, то да, нужно писать кастом таги, э, которые описывают эти разные виджеты. Но на самом деле директивы удобнее всего использовать для кастом атрибьютов. Вот. Как, как я показывал вот в, в примере, там, где placeholder, скажем, shame placeholder для старых браузеров. Это жутко удобно. Вот. А чаще всего лучше просто описывать свою логику, как бы э, просто используя контроллеры, используя разные там view, которые подгружаются. Да, были. То есть если э, э, раппингом заниматься и стараться как-то обвернуть jQuery какой-то э, компонент, jQuery UI, скажем, в StartHQ есть, например, jQuery там, э, draggable или как он там называется, вот, то там легко промазать, потому что э, фишка в том, что э, jQuery, то есть Angular, ему нужно знать, в каком состоянии дом в любой момент. Вот. И когда происходит какой-то ивент, Angular должен знать, что это произошло, чтобы как бы отобразить все эти изменения в самом доме, либо же в дата структуре. Вот. А jQuery просто все это портит. Да? jQuery приходит, начинает там, добавлять свои дата uh, элементы, вот, начинает менять дата структуру, с которой заработаешь и так далее. То есть для jQuery нужно, если делать раперы вокруг jQuery плагинов, нужно использовать um, Angular методы apply вот, и watch, которые как бы внутри блока apply, um, как бы все, что происходит там над, над, как бы над датой, uh, Angular об этом знает. Вот. Так что как-то вот так. Uh, 